Uh, let's pray. Lord, for this, as for anything else in our lives, we are people in desperate need of help. We cannot do this that we're about to do, nor anything else in our lives, apart from your rescuing, enabling, forgiving, transforming, and delivering grace. Would you grace us with your presence, and your power this afternoon, we would pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I was in the throes of parenting. It was a Tuesday night, about 11 o'clock, and Luella, my dear wife, said to me words that no tired father wants to hear. We have nothing for the children's lunches tomorrow. Can you go get something? I did that very happily with a servant spirit. (laughs) So I got in the car. It was cold outside, sort of grumbling. uh, Went to the local grocery store, picked up the requisite things for lunches. And I I can't forget this moment. I, I was... Stopped at the light, the street light, uh, going out from the parking lot of the store there (coughs) and was just overwhelmed. Overwhelmed with responsibility, the confusing, chaotic responsibility of raising four children. I... It felt like I would start putting on my pants on Monday, and by Saturday I'd have them on. It just the weeks went that fast. And in that moment, I reflected on what it would be like to be single again. (laughs) Now, I'm being serious. There's ways in which that's humorous, but there's another way in which I was bloodlessly murdering my family. And... It was so frightening to me, I pulled over to the curb, and I just started to weep. God, help me. You've got to help me. I don't know what I'm doing, and I feel so burdened by what I'm doing. And I think I'm a terrible representative of you. And I want to believe it wasn't a mistake to entrust these four children to my care, but I feel like it was. Now, how many parents are in the room? If you can't relate to this story, you're either seriously comatose (laughs) or you're not being honest. You know those moments. And I think one of the things that is going on, I think it's the principal thing that's going on inside of us, is that somehow the gospel that we celebrate on Sunday, the gospel that we hear and we luxuriate in in a worship service, the gospel that we throw our heads back and raise our hands to in worship services doesn't get to the place where it shapes that primary responsibility of everyday life. We forget the gospel for us and we forget the gospel for our children, and what shapes what we do is something that looks alien often to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, It doesn't look the same. It doesn't feel the same. It doesn't work the same. It doesn't reach for the same tools. It's, it's, It's different. I mean, if you were, if you were counseling a struggling, uh, person your age, you wouldn't say to them, I can't believe the things you do. You wouldn't get up in their face so much, so close they could feel your breath and say inflammatory things to them. You wouldn't remind them that you are way more righteous than they are. And you would have never thought of doing the things that they do. But we do that with our children. You wouldn't think 
that volume has the cha- possibility of changing the heart. But we do with our children. It doesn't look the same. And, and so after literally hundreds of conversations with parents who are lost in the middle of their own parenting story, who are frustrated and discouraged and overburdened, I could not not write that parenting book. Because I thought we've, we celebrate the gospel, but on Sunday, but on Tuesday in our homes, we're gospel amnesiacs. We forgot who we are. We forgot what we've been given. We forgot who our children are. We've forgotten what they need. And we reach for tools that don't work. And so I just want to get you this afternoon, because this is all the time that we have, to consider three words. Three words that I think are rooted in the gospel and have the possibility of altering the way you think about this thing. I mean, what could be more important in all of life than to be God's tool on site for the forming of a human soul? What could ever rise to the level of more importance than that? And so it's important that we understand who we are. It's important that we understand what we've been given. It's important that what we do in our homes is consistent with the gospel that we say is our hope. Three words. Ambassador, inability, grace. Ambassador, inability, grace. I would like you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, before I look at this passage with you, beginning with verse 16, uh, I have to say something about this book that will be our guide. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but your Bible isn't arranged by topic. That frustrates some of you. You wish it was arranged by topic and there are little tabs on the side of the page, so you go to your topic of interest. The Bible isn't arranged by topic because of divine editorial error, but because of divine intention. The Bible is essentially a grand redemptive story. Maybe a better way to say it is the Bible is a theologically annotated story. It's a story with God's essential explanatory and applicatory notes. Now, what this means is if you're going to understand the task of parenting, you just can't go to the parenting passages because that's not the way the Bible's arranged. If all you do is go to the obvious parenting passages, you miss the vast majority of the things that God has to say to you about this significant area of everyday life. In fact, if you just go to the parenting passages, you will not understand the parenting passages, but because they're in the context of other passages that exegete that passage that you have now isolated. Does that make sense? I want to rip my hair out as I hear people talk about Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Just shoot me dead. Because it's handled in a topical, isolated way that is forgetful of the grand sweep of this story that actually exegetes the principles that are in that passage. Does that make sense? And so, to the degree that every passage tells me something about God and something about myself and something about life in this fallen world, and some about the disaster of sin, and some about the operation of grace, to that degree, every passage tells me about something in my life. That's how the Bible works. Okay, let me read for you. In fact, I want to start with verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. 
The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are... You whispered. <laughs> Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. <clears throat> now there's, there's so much in this passage that I don't have, I don't have time to, to unpack for you. But notice the problem. The problem is listed in verse 15. It's the problem that every parent must deal with. It's a problem that's shocking and disconcerting and will rear its ugly head again and again. Paul says Jesus came so that those who live would do what? No longer live for themselves. Sin makes me insert myself in the center of my universe to make life all about me. Sound like your kids? Sin reduces the field of my concern down to my wants, my needs, my feelings. Sin is selfish in the true sense of what that means. You should not be surprised at the selfishness of your children. You should not be surprised at the low-level violence of your children. You should not be surprised. That's what sin does. And if you understand the depth and expansiveness of this problem, you will not think that you can manage it. Because you can't. You will not come up with enough rules and enough created systems of control to manage this deep, dark thing. If it could be managed, Jesus would have never come. Stop trying to manage iniquity. It doesn't work. So Paul says, our job is to carry one message. What's the message? Be reconciled to God. Listen, the problem of your children is not horizontal. The problem of your children is vertical. Every horizontal dysfunction is rooted in vertical brokenness. That's gospel parenting. And if you have, if you pay attention, you have moments that are just stunning as you see the depth of what we're actually dealing with. We were going on a long family road trip, vacation road trip. If you ever want to experience depravity, <laughs> go on a long family road trip. And you'll not experience your children's, you'll experience yours. And my son Ethan had, those days, had polyps in his nose. And he would wheeze when he breathed. It was kind of distracting. <laughs> Summer on the trip, my daughter, who was sitting next to him, said, Daddy, Ethan is bothering me. I said, what is he doing? And without hesitating, she said, he's breathing. <laughs> oh, I'm not done yet. Not being able to resist the next question, I said to her, what would you like me to do? And without a moment break, she said, tell him to stop. <laughs> Your respirating is bothering me. Die. <laughs> Just put him in the trunk, Dad. His body will dump him someplace at a plaza, 
because as long as he's alive, life isn't enjoyable to me. Now, how could you ever look at that and think that you could ever do anything to fix that? You see, what it means to be an ambassador is to be a representative. It means everything you do, every encounter, every word, every action, every reaction is meant to represent the one who sent you. His message, his methods, his character. Parenting is never about what you want for your children and what you want from your children. Let me say that again. Parenting is never to be shaped by what you want for your children and what you want from your children because that's parental kingship. That's not parental, parental ambassadorship. You're not a parental king. You're in a parental ambassador. And so what God says, the problem is vertical. The problem has to do with me. You are there to represent my presence, my will, my wisdom, my law, my grace. And that means you don't have the right to do this however you'd like to do it. Because here's what it means to be an ambassador. Every encounter you have with your children is to be a beautiful picture of the God that they need. Every encounter you have with your children is meant to be a beautiful picture of the God that they need and that you've been called to represent now, who in this room would say, oh, yeah, I can do that. That's easy. None of us. Let me, let's talk about authority. That means every time I exercise authority, it must be a beautiful picture of the authority of God. How are you doing? Because, you see, here's the issue. I am, I am dealing with children who have bought into two devastating lies. Let me give them to you. The lie of autonomy and the lie of self-sufficiency. Every sinner buys into these lies at birth. The lie of autonomy says, I'm an independent human being, Excuse me, and I have the right to live my life any way I want to live it. I'm an independent human being. I have the right to live my life any way I want to live it. I'm the only authority that I need. Parents know this. Those battles over what to eat are not about diet. This child has not read the paleo diet book and has decided, I want to eat in a different way. Those are about authority. That child is saying, I'm autonomous, and you will not tell me what to put in my mouth. You are parenting little self-appointed self-sovereigns. That, that war over when to go into bed is not about sleep. The child hasn't done a sleep study. It's about autonomy. This, this natural resistance as a sinner to the enforcing of any authority on you. Your children are natural rebels to authority. Second lie is the lie of self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency says, I have everything I need within myself to be what I'm supposed to be and to do what I'm supposed to do. I have everything inside of myself to be what I'm supposed to be and to do what I'm supposed to do. Well, self-sufficiency, you know, is a lie. And if you pay attention, you can see self-sufficiency operating. Little, little Jimmy is three, four years old, and he realizes, he's realized that his shoes have laces. <coughs> and... He begins to fumble with his laces to try to tie a bow. Now, this, this little boy has no bowdom inside of himself. He has not had one boistic moment yet. 
he needs bow instruction. Uh, he, could, he could fumble with those laces for a century and never make a bow. But when you reach down to help him, what does he do? Parents, you, you've experienced this. He slaps away your hand because he wants to believe that he doesn't need anyone but himself. Now, here's what this means. There is inside of your children a natural rebellion to authority. Their view is authority crushes me. Authority robs me of my identity. Authority's not a good thing. So if I exercise authority in a harsh, impatient selfish, ugly way, I am reinforcing the natural rebellion of my children to authority. It makes sense to me that there are teenagers in Christian families who can't wait to get out of the home because of the ugly, impatient, name-calling, pseudo-violent way authority has been exercised. If you haul up and slap your child's face, don't call that godly authority. That's ugly, impatient human anger, violence meted out against the body of one made in the image of God. And what it does is it begins to condition this child to think of authority in a negative way. Why would this child find hope in a God who is an absolute authority? Of course he wouldn't. You're a representative. You're an ambassador. And what you have to do is you have to immediately confess you're not able. That's that second word. You're not able. First of all, you have no ability whatsoever to create the change in that child that needs to happen. Parents, you hear what I said? You have no ability whatsoever, none, zip not to change your child, none. You have no ability to change your child. 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 And again, I say unto you, you have no ability to change your child. If you assign yourself that ability, you have named yourself as the fourth member of the Trinity, there's only three seats in case you're counting and they're gloriously occupied. But you will do things and say things that you shouldn't do to try to get change that you cannot create. Why would we ever think that volume will change a human heart? Or more elaborate vocabulary? Or a bigger threat? But that's what we do. You have, you have no ability to change your child. None. In fact, I'm convinced parental hope is rooted in parental hopelessness. It's only when you begin to give up on your power that you begin to find hope in God's power. Parents, give up on your power. You don't have any. You don't. You have position by God's plan. And that position is important, but you don't have that power. And when you assign yourself to power, you will invariably do things that you shouldn't do. Inability. Second, you have no independent ability to actually do what God's called you to do. Not only can you not create change, you don't even have the ability to be a tool of change. It's counterintuitive for me to be patient. It's counterintuitive for me to be tender. It's counterintuitive for me to be loving when you're a bit of a creep. It's counterintuitive for me to look at you with a heart of love when you're making my life difficult. It's counterintuitive for me to get up in the morning and say, Lord, would you just reveal the heart of my children to me today? That means 
If I'm ever going to do this thing that God has called me to do, I need to be rescued from me. Because the thing that is in the way of my parenting is not the people who I'm parenting. It's me. I have no ability independently to do what God has called me to do. His call in every aspect is counterintuitive. Now, I'll tell you what this means for me. I've done this for many years. For me, it means I try to do this every morning before I get out of bed. But if I don't do it before I get out of bed, sometime in the morning, I try to pray these three prayers. I want to give them to you. The first prayer is, God, I'm a man in desperate need of help. If you're a woman, you don't have to say man. God, I'm a man in desperate need of help. It's a confession. It's a confession that my Lord hears, but it's, a, it's an important reminder for me. God, I'm a man in desperate need of help. Second prayer. I pray that you would send your helpers my way. Won't you please send your helpers my way? That could be a passage of Scripture. That could be uh, a worship song. That could be someone in my life. Send your helpers my way. Oh, please, Lord. Third prayer. And Lord, please give me the humility to receive the help when it comes. God, I'm a man in desperate need of help. I pray that you'd send my helpers my way, your helpers my way. And Lord, please give me the humility to receive the help that it comes. Maybe you are thinking, Paul, well, this thought of inability is is discouraging. I would propose to you it's liberating. I think one of the reasons that parents are discouraged and overburdened and frustrated is they wake up every morning and load the burden of the welfare of their children on their shoulders as if they were carrying it on their own. No wonder you're discouraged. No wonder you're overburdened. No wonder this thing is so troublesome to you. Parents, you don't carry the welfare of your children. Jesus does. And you are never called to be anything more than a tool in His hands. You're an ambassador. The narrative of Scripture is clear. God calls no one to ministry because they're able He calls us because He's able. God didn't give you children because you're able. God gave you children because He's able. And knowing the limits of your ability is free. Because it removes that burden off your shoulders. And you're free to ask the question, what does it mean to be a tool in God's hands. Last word is grace. This goes two ways. First, it's the humble recognition that I'm more unlike, I'm more like my children than unlike them. Do you hear what I said? I'm more like my children than unlike them. The illustration I've used many times, let's just say that it's 10.30 at night on a Thursday night and your high schooler comes to you and says, I have a science project due tomorrow. You know that project was assigned six years ago. (laughs) And going where you don't want to go, you say, what do you need? And the child says, well, I need some markers. They start out easy. Well... You, you, we learned very early in our parenting always based by water-based markers because when they dry out, you can cut the blunt end out, you can pour water down in them, and you get new life out of them. I'm a Christian. I believe in the principle of resurrection. <laughs> they say, what else you need? I, some cardboard. We have enough cardboard around the house and duct tape. We can approximate poster board. 
And then you say, what else you need? And they mumble very quickly, 12 baby chickens. <laughs> and in the, in the glory of your ambassadorial parenting, you say, well, then go upstairs and lay them. <laughs> and then you say, in my day, I would have never thought of coming to my parents the night before a science project and telling them that I need all these things. Well, in my day, we didn't even have science projects. I made them up myself, and I sat on those eggs myself. Now think about this. Think about the, the self-righteousness of that response. Your problem is that you're just not as righteous as I am. Versus the recognition that there's few things that I could ever identify in the life of my children that I can't still identify in my life. Now stay with me. In a single word, tell me what was the problem of that child. Procrastination. Are you actually so bold as to say <laughs> there's no procrastination anywhere in your life? Anybody here have a garage you can't drive into? You keep telling yourself you're going to clean it someday. It's now bulging. It may take out the whole neighborhood. Anybody do your taxes the day of? You know the post office that stays open till midnight? You know all the other procrastinators? It's like a family reunion. <laughs> this year you're going to bring the brownies? See, how different is it when you say, son, I know exactly how you got yourself in this situation because I'm like you. I tend to prioritize the things that I find enjoyable and put off the things that I find distasteful. And I get myself in trouble too. I love you. And God loves you. And there's a God of wisdom who sheds his grace on us to rescue us from our own foolishness. You know what? You're going to have to go tomorrow and be honest with your science teacher but I love you and God loves you. Who wouldn't want to have that person as your parent? Seriously. You see, nobody gives grace better than a person who knows that they need it themselves. It's your humble admission of the depth of your own need of grace that gives you tenderness and patience with your children. How is it possible for us to say, I can't believe you do such a thing. You're a sinner. You shouldn't be surprised. Now here's what's troubling as I, as I talk about grace to parents. When I use the word grace, they think permissive parenting. Do you hear me? And listen, grace never calls wrong right. If wrong were right, there would be no need for grace. Grace is a way of dealing with wrong rather than just an announcement of punishment and words of condemnation. I move toward you asking myself the question, what is it? that God wants to do in this moment in the life of this child, and how can I be part of that? Here's the model. Oh, hear what I'm going to say. If your eyes ever see or your ears ever hear the sin, weakness, and failure of your children, it's never an accident. It's never an interruption. It's never a hassle. It's always grace. God loves that child. He's put him in a family of faith, and he will reveal the heart of that child to you so you can be a tool of his help and rescue. There's parenting. God won't wait for your schedule. He won't wait for your idea of a good time. But he, out of glorious redemptive love, out of bountiful grace, he will again and again reveal the heart of that child to you so you can be part of what he wants to do in the heart of that child. Don't get mad at that. Don't call that a bad day. That's a good day. Because God is giving you an opportunity to be part of the most significant work in the universe. It's called redemption.
Our children are spiritually blind. They don't see themselves with accuracy. And not only are they blind, they're blind to their blindness. And so I'm always asking the question, how can I be an instrument of seeing in the life of this child? What right now does God want this child to see? And how can I help him see it? It's grace. You see, the law has important function in the lives of your children. The law does a brilliant job of revealing sin, exposing sin. The law is a wonderful guide for your children's living. Stay with me. But it has no power whatsoever to rescue and transform the heart of your child. If all your children needed was a nice, a neat set of rules with a corollary set of enforcements, Jesus would have never had to come. You cannot reduce parenting down to being a prosecutor and a judge and a jailer. Because although the law has glorious purposes in the heart of the child, the law itself is a grace. It doesn't have the ability to do what the child needs. And so Paul says, you go out there and you, don't, you stay on message. The message is be reconciled with, to God. Your problem isn't just that you've been nasty with me. Your problem isn't just that you've been selfish with your siblings. Your problem isn't that you're disrespectful to your teachers. Your problem isn't just that you're lazy with your homework. All of that is rooted in a deeper problem. You have dethroned the Almighty and you've put yourself in His place. When do you start having that conversation? The minute your child is born. Because this little one is assembling pieces. And they'll get fragments, and those fragments will be collected together, and you have a process view of parenting. It's a progressive sanctification view of parenting. You'll have conversation after conversation after conversation. Your goal is not to win in a given conversation because you know God is good. You're going to wake up with this child again. You're going to have another opportunity. But you're rooting this child in his existence as one who was created for surrender to the Almighty. And it's not about athletic prowess and musical skill and good SAT scores and a great college. It's not about those things. It's about a rebel to God who needs to be rescued from himself. And God will give me opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to confess that that's me too. And to represent an agenda greater and glorious than any agenda I would have for my own children. You can't make sense out of the problem of parenting and the solution without the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is our model. Let's pray. Lord, we have run across an expansive surface in just a few moments. And I pray that you would use these things that we can consider to set us on a new tra trajectory. May we be those ambassadors representing you well, confessing our inability, being humble, tender, patient, but zealous tools of your grace in the lives of our children, we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.